Monsieur Calonne, do a warm welcome to Ricard. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and thank you to the uh, Scottish Documentary Institute and to Marcelices and Iberodos. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you. Uh, first of all, I was uh, two days ago. I was uh, watching some images from whom my father made like uh, 50 years ago, for 56, and I was uh, a very very little boy, and I managed to uh, to digitalize all of this material. I two days ago I saw it after 30 years, and watching the material, I saw myself as a child, younger than my son now. I saw my father, uh, uh, and I am now older than my father in these images. And I saw my grandfather, ill already, who is now older, an old man, older than my mother now. So I was very moved and very shocked. I will work with this material to make something from it, for sure. But this is what film is about for me, it's about time about uh, capturing this time which is uh, escaping. Time, the only thing uh, knows how to do is to pass. Huh? And it's passing continuously. And uh, with the camera, we are able to, to capture these little fragments of our delicate uh, life. And I, I use the camera for this. I think uh, this is about, uh, filmmaking is about this. And this is maybe the difference between documentary filmmaking uh, and uh, still images, because when you make documentary films, you are capturing, let's say, the, the phantoms we are. I mean, how the, the life is continuously escaping, the present, the vanishing of uh, our present. I think in a way, maybe I, uh, I have tried to capture uh, this, uh, this present and, and this life all, all my life. No? When I think also about um, about uh, why I make films. I don't know really the answer, but it's wh what I say now of talking with you is to, to express uh, my relation to life, to, the, to, to solve my curiosity, and to help to express my point of view. But uh, it has to do also maybe with, uh, with these first images from Sup Super 8. Uh, and I remember when I went to Berlin, and there I discovered the work from Jean Roux, the, the uh, French filmmaker. And I, I saw his films. Uh, for me, it was a, a surprise because in his films, I recognized the, the freshness, the spontaneity of uh, my father's films, who were just uh, amateur film. But uh, Jean Roux was able to, to film in a very spontaneously and a very fresh way. That was he was calling uh, cinema plaisir, uh, the pleasure of making films, the the uh, the joy of making films, and I got big influence from Jean Roux. I have a, a part of my films that have a very important anthropological uh, point of view, and Jean Roux is characterized also for his concept of cine trans. This is the the state that a filmmaker uh, has when he is. Uh, uh, filming something that, that you know you are the only one who has the possibility to capture this moment. Imagine in the jungle, you are going to see in, in South, South Cameroon, and, and you have the camera. So when you shoot, when you're shooting this, you get in a kind of uh, hypnotical state, in a kind of, uh, of trance, huh? because you can capture this time, this escaping time. Uh, I know that cinema will nev never last. Bresson knew that, and he said that it's a very fragile art. But for certain years, we, we, we can capture this, this time. So I'm going to show you one sequence shot in South Cameroon with the Ebusok. This is a, a, a feature-length film about the uh, witchcraft doctors who held the illness of the, of the soul. Uh, what they call uh, witchcraft. And to cure that, you will see here there's a woman dressed in red, uh, she's insane, and they make a ceremony which is called Dance to the Spirit. The sequence is made in the jungle, it was completely dark. I took one, uh, one electrical group to light it uh, with uh, four uh, lamps with a sound man. 
and we were shooting, the sequence is quite long, but I will show you only just a, a piece. Uh, we shoot like uh, six hours uh, all the time without stopping. And I remember when I told the sound man, he was from, from Cameroon, okay, we can rest. He is standing like this with the perch, with the, yeah, with the, for the sound, how do you call it? And he was sleeping like this, you know? <laughs> Uh, amazing. <laughs> so let's have a take a look. So, uh, before you were, we were talking and you were asking me uh, how I get in touch with the people and how you establish one relation with the characters. Uh, this is something, as you know, very difficult. But uh, uh, one rule that I, that I have is that uh, I, I know that in life everybody uh, wants something from everybody. So you want something from me, I want something from you, and it's natural and it's a free exchange. So uh, in documentary filmmakers, you are not paying the people usually, uh, and you have to make a kind of agreement. I mean, agreement is I know they, they need something from me, and I need something from them, 
and I don't want that they have the impression that I am a vampire. There are uh, uh, films made by, let's say, vampires that the only important thing is to make their own films and to sacrifice everyth everything in benefit of the film. This is a very bad method because at, uh, uh, in the middle of the shooting they will notice and they will keep distance. So the best thing is that they get your trust. And to get your, your trust, you have to give them something. So a lot of nights, I remember this night, I was uh, really very, very tired and uh, exhausted. Uh, but at the end, I have to, to make all the band full with the people. <laughs> no, no, full with the people who were uh, there in the party, full. I mean, full. There was not uh, a space for any person more. And we have to drive kilometers long for hours to bring everybody to their own houses. So that was not prepared, but that's something you have to do. And you have to, to know uh, when you have to leave the camera and you have to give them their friendship or whatsoever because they need something. And, um, and also, you have to drink. Huh? With them, we drink a lot of uh, palm wine, very tasty, and I like it. And uh, with the Bedouins, I drank a lot of tea. With, uh, with the fishermen in Spain, a lot of beer and wine. And to, for making the, the film in the coal mines in, in, in Leon, in North Spain, a lot of uh, strong uh, liquor. No? So it depends. Uh, you have to do something and to create a relationship. No? And they must uh, uh, know that what you are doing is going to respect them and they must like your, your, what you are doing. Uh, they should respect it, but they must approve it in a way. No? Uh, thanks to the camera, I have been lucky to go to film in South Cameroon with the Ebusok, to film the Bedouins in the Negev Desert, to film in the coal mines in, 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 in Spain, or the fishermen in, in uh, the fence, that maybe you are going to see this, this afternoon. So uh, in this sense, I'm very thankful to, uh, to the camera. Uh, talking about, um, about uh, one film, this one, uh, Black Earth, this, is, this film is connected in a way to Edinburgh because uh, this film was the first one, the first uh, feature film I made after coming back from the film school in Germany. And it has to do with two things, with Edinburgh in a way and with a memory of my childhood. Like, like maybe many of the subjects, subjects, they have to do with your childhood because there you are creating all your inputs that are forming your character and later it's like the contracts or the conflict with the uh, reality, with the uh, mature life and with your in, uh, inner thoughts. So there is a, a constant dialectic between, between these really very old memories. So I remember that when I was very young, I went to the bar and I remember to see my, my father talking with my uh, uncle. And my uncle was working in, uh, as an engineer in a coal mine and he was telling that they, they were going with jeeps, with uh, tr trucks, in, in the coal mines, driving inside. So for me, that was an amazing picture. And, um, and later on, when I was studying cinema in Berlin, I got uh, sick and I st stayed in the house. And uh, usually there, the people, when they move they, from a house to the other, they, they leave the books outside. So I pick up one book, and it was called The Black Indians. Uh, and it was a book about the discoverment, the end of the, of the, of the coal mining in here, in Scotland. And the, the one uh, engineer was living here in Cannon Gate and uh, they found an a incredible gallery in Everfoil in Sterling. So I came here uh, for the first time and I was, you know, Jules Verne was like Hergé. He was very exact, very accurate with the places and with everything. So I was following here the steps, what he was writing in the book, and I make this trip through Everfoil, through Sterling, and so on. So for me it was a very moving uh, uh, trip and later on I make this, this film, Black Earth. is one of the Maybe the first Spanish film who was almost entirely uh, shot uh, under the earth in the coal mines. And it was uh, 
uh, wonderful but very dangerous experience because it was difficult for light, for sound, for everything, for security. When you film in a coal mine, you have to stay in the in the in the trees, you know, in the in the woods, and maybe like this with one hand and the other with the camera. And if you fall down, really, uh, it's it's dangerous. And you don't have light, so every time you put the light, they know they are they are conscious that you are filming. So you have to play with it. So you are making a, you, are, you are staging uh, events. And, and forcing that, uh, and creating a, 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 an atmosphere that will allow them to develop a spontaneously conversation. Uh? So here you will see uh, one scene uh, like this. And for me, this film also was very important. For the sound, was also very difficult. All the equipment had to be roped in plastic to, to protect it. And we spent a few hours every day protecting the material then going down and afterwards we have to clean everything else again three four hours huh? so it was very complicated but uh, here you can see uh, a sequence where the, um, the 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 camera is really very very close to the people we are in a dangerous place and a conversation where they say in part what i wanted because i prepare one of them in one moment you have to ask this this thing only I gave them one clue, and the rest is something that uh, is created by them due to the relation we we, we had. No? It's a um, it's an observational uh, sequence. All the films observational is what I usually do. I don't usually I don't make interviews. I I just collaborate with the people. I film a conversation. No? The, the sound we put, uh, we put uh, neck mics, like this one, but we put them here in the helmet. And what this was interesting is that uh, in this film, I started with a, a specific concept. Who was, okay, fixed camera. And, uh, but later on I realized that uh, that, that didn't fit. That uh, I had to move the camera to transmit, uh, to give the impression of the of the mind. So in the film, uh, uh, the camera it changes, and at the end is the camera who is afraid also. Mm -hmm. huh? So the camera moves. It's interesting how you start with a concept, and uh, maybe you have to change. I always think that shooting a film, it comes one moment that you have really a very big problem, because you don't know uh, how to get good sequences and so on. I think that you need maybe four or five good sequences for a film. And until I don't have the first one, I am suffering like, like a hell. Huh? <laughs> so uh, I am fighting to get this, this sequence. And um, well, it's, it's, it's not an easy, an easy process. Huh? But maybe we see this, this sequence. <laughs> Now, you will see now an owl, and this is what it was left on this book from Jules Verne. Of course, we put him in the mine.
So there is a lot of to talk uh, about it, um, but uh, uh, it's interesting because I I like to film work a lot. I think this is maybe an influence, or I, I, I like to see it, uh, like this from uh, the British documentary film movement, uh, Grison, Scottish uh, filmmaker, and uh, all of them they were very interested in filming work. Uh, this is something very seldom nowadays. Film work is for me a, a social act, an anthropological one, 
uh, and also a political one. No? I think that uh, uh, the tribes dis disappear already, the clans and so on, but uh, uh, they are left or they are created other tribes like the student tribe, the filmmaker tribe, the banker tribe, the politician one, and so on. And I think uh, uh, miners, people defini de defined by one work, create their own tribe and their own, their own culture. No? And I like the gesture I feel the gesture of, of working, no? the, the handwork. I like to feel hands. I like also to film uh, unknown people. If uh, somebody is important and worse, if he's aware that he's important, then it's very difficult because it will he will create many difficulties to the film and, and to me. If somebody is aware how he can use the camera, then we have a problem. I, I, I like to, to see Nanook's film, and when Flaherty was uh, showing Nanook's uh, close-up, his uh, regard uh, was very naive. Mm -hmm. uh, now the regard is, is different. I look many times to, to, to have one regard, uh, a naive one, or, a, or expressing fear to the camera. Also, I'm very interested to feel fear. I think all our society is defined by fear. Everybody uh, has fear to not to succeed in his work, uh, not to succeed uh, in his life, whatsoever. I mean, the United States is full with fear, but also our countries. And this one is a film about the fear. During all the film, uh, you see that they are very macho, that they're very powerful men, but at the end you see the fear in their eyes, and, and they say, yes, I, it's not that I have fear, I am in panic. Huh? So, uh, this... I, I like also to film a uh, landscape. And the coal mine is a landscape. A landscape for me is not the background, it's uh, one character more. And I treat the landscape in close-up, in medium soft, soft, and I develop him as really a, a character. I learned, learned this from John Ford, of course, Monument Valley or Ireland or whatsoever. It's a landscape. No? It's like now, yesterday I was walking along Edinburgh, and Edinburgh is a spiritual landscape. We were talking, Edinburgh is full of reference to the time, you know, the graveyards, the banks with names of people who died a long time ago, the memory of the past of the ancestors. So even the bodies of whiskey, we saw someone's like 5,000 pounds. You know? But I, I, they, I look to them, it's, I like whiskey a lot, but, uh, but it's like a bottle uh, containing time, you know, like 15 years, 20, 40 years. So everything here is talking about, about time. And you have the presence of the ancestors. So you're not so isolate, isolate in your moment if, if, if in life. And I think I was always filming this uh, time you know? and, and using the camera to connect and to know other people and to have other, other experiences. You know? I am, I, I'm shy, and the camera, you know, is a, is a tool who helps you to get in touch with people. You can hide behind the camera. Um, we are not shy behind the camera. No? Also something that uh, is important, I was thinking about now while watching the film, is the distance. In film, you have to choose the, ang the angle, uh, the optic, so on. I think that the optic never lies. So you, you, if you use a, 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 a tele, you are saying, I am afraid, I am taking distance. Huh? In fiction, you can use it in a different way, but here you see the reality. You have Van der Koike was saying that you have to film the people at the distance of, of one's arm, so he can give you back the punch. Huh? <laughs> so uh, I like this sentence. I, I, and I think filming is also a question of distance in different ways, but distance is something uh, we should we should solve. Huh? Does it vary from yes, yes, this is different. It's also different between men and women, depending on culture. In the when I was making the film about the Bedouins, oof, the distance was very um, difficult, and that was my first uh, feature-length film. And I was developing the f the all the film in the um, in the labor in 60 millimeters, but I could only. Uh, watch some frames because I w was developing the positive in Berlin. 
So they were stopping from time to time, and that they did it uh, every 15 days. So then uh, uh, I saw uh, I saw that I was filming very little close-ups, very few, and I start to film the close-ups at the end of the shooting. This is something that happens in usually in the first films, and it can happen later that you film or uh, with a very big distance, or you don't have the close-ups, or uh, or you film too short, eh? because maybe you are afraid, and sometimes you think that that you will not. Uh, we, that is better if you feel with distance because you will not, uh, the people, they will not notice you. That's, that's not like this. The people always notice when the, there is a camera. So it's better to come and say, okay, I'm filming you, I go with you. We do it together, okay? Okay. So then we go together. Then she will not feel being observed, like, like here. Then here I'm like a, a spy. You know? So the distance is always um, a very important thing. No. No, not really. They were, they were. Uh, well, I was living there with this uh, doctor, and that was an amazing experience because we were um, sleeping in, in, in a hut, which was with an age of hospital, and every night uh, he was uh, with a sword making, you know, um, making spiritual things in in. Uh, in a turtle, in a death turtle like this, and we were sleeping with this sound. And uh, he was very clever, very intelligent, and a man who believes in this uh, mm, this medicine, but also in the modern modern medicine. So I, we we could talk, and I was living in his house, so he trusts me, and I trust him. No? But the atmosphere was very, really very, very dark around, and, and you never uh, know, okay? And, uh, but I, I put the lights, and with the lights, it's obvious that everything is going to change. You see here the light, but this is a lot of light in the jungle, in the darkness. But after uh, some half an hour, they adapt, and they have to do what they have to do. This is uh, dance uh, to enjoy, because uh, this performance is not is to the spirits, but it's also to them, and they like the the spirit they will enjoy, and they like to drink, and they like to have fun, so they will have fun. Yeah. Mm. Here, again about time, mm. because they are talking about uh, this forest, this uh, the, this the coal is very uh, mineral that has to do with, with us, for example, because we, ha we have the same uh, ke chemical um, stuff, you know? S uh, and I told them, look, I want you to talk about the trees yeah? and about the origin of this one, of the coal. Yeah? Because for me, it was very important that they are working and breathing something, that they were trees uh, many, many years ago, and we human, we will become something like this. You know? Can this cycle of nature, uh, which also you can feel it and see it in the short films that maybe some of you are going to see uh, today. I think there is a connection, in a way, between some of the short films because I never made the film thinking that I have uh, something like a style. Never, uh, I wish, yeah, but I never th thought like this, and I never thought there is. There must be a. a a kind of harmony and coherence. But now, with the time, I think maybe there is. For example, in the Alaria del Rio, on the river banks, you see a, a gypsy family. They are very happy, and the landscape, they are besi beside the river. Everything is hope, everything is joy. In other fields, loneliness is not going to be shown. Uh, you see also somebody uh, in Argentina, in the delta of Parana, he's an old man, he's alone with no family. So the time passed. And that represents also a time I was also very, very, very lonely. And the last film, I called The Last Fair, is about uh, burial uh, ritual, about um, 
yes, I say it's the last fair. It's a fair where everybody is trying to sell burial things. So you see, it's like a three, uh, three, three steps in a way, no? And also, I want to, to say that there is a difference between short films and uh, feature-length films, because when I make short films, it's are films that n I could never get money to make them, never. Because nobody is going to give me a, a money to make a film about a GC family on the riverside, okay? Or about uh, fishermen who are going to fish tuna, huh? or about uh, 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 pr the less fair. No? no, I make them with my own resources, with my own money, and because I want to make this film, because I need to make them, and I need to to keep on working, you know, it's like I, I need to train the, the, the work, the, the gesture. So they are more fresh, they are more spontaneously than the uh, feature length film. For these ones, I need to develop a structure, to think about the structure alone, 90 minutes or longer, very well, to erase the money, which can take two years, three years, four years, and a lot of times, uh, half of the project I could never make them, they're in the cover. And, um, and then the shooting time, for the short film, maybe I, I a la orilla del rio was one day, uh, the fence was also one or two days, the last fair, two days, but uh, these ones, is black earth, uh, like nine weeks, the pit is like uh, three months, and this one, uh, the Dance to the Spirit, like uh, four, four or five weeks. No? So you need a uh, longer time. It's li like if you compare a symphony and a suite. It's not about the quality, but uh, the work is, uh, is different. No? And in, in the short films, I never write a script. I just go to the, with the camera, and I know I can, I can film. We know that we can do it. But we never get the money to do it. I mean, we can make films like painters, like poets, who go to the, to the, aus to the outskirts and, and they spend one, one afternoon and, and they paint. So we could make films like this. Mm -hmm. We should. And for other films, we need to convince people to talk, to talk, to talk. And this is really hard, hard work, you know? Yeah. And uh, so you have questions, please? Um, Yeah. In a short, I mean, do you feel you no. got um, the same need for those moments? Mm, okay, I, I, need, I need a story. I need, I need something. But I can, I can develop something that it can hold by itself, by the atmosphere, by the poetic. But in a long film, you cannot hold this poetic along 90 minutes. You can hold it here, and then you have to give some other technique, uh, information, some conflicts, other stuff, and then you can come back to the poetry at the end. Eh? But uh, in a short film, yes, it's, it's, it's different, it's different. Uh, even though you have to have something. For example, in the fence, uh, it's about tuna fishing. I shot the film in two days, but it took me uh, a lot of months to think uh, what is going to, to be at the end with which image. So I shot uh, three images of the sea in Barcelona later on. No? So to think, uh, uh, what is the story about? Huh? Uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, the films like you know, the Dance of the Spirit, so this one kind of was a big. Um, do you do many pick-up shots afterwards? Once after you no, in Dance to the Spirit, not so many, because we had uh, very little time. In uh, Black Earth, also not that much. Mm -hmm. In The Pit, about the orchestra in the opera from Eliseo, yes. I, had, mm, I could have made two films, three films, yeah. That yes. In, in On the River Banks, L'Oreal Rio, no, it's one to, to two. And uh, in The Fence, it's one to four. So, and in the last fair, it's maybe one to Six, seven, I don't know, I don't remember. No? No, not so much material. No? I, I, I want to put you, I don't know if we have time, 15 minutes, 
so um, I can uh, show you uh, one film I was commissioned. Well, it's not one film, one, one piece, let's say, uh, about uh, Frederick Weisman. Hmm? You know Frederick Weisman? So he was uh, nominated Doctor Honoris Causa by the University Pompeo Fabra of Barcelona. And they told me to make a short uh, film to, to, to show during the ceremony. So I, I have some of the new generation of uh, filmmakers in, in, in Spain. And I asked uh, them to describe uh, one sequence from Weisman. No? It's uh, like 40 minutes. And it's interesting because besides what they are going to say, I will tell you why also Weisman, Jan Roos, Jonas Makers, also these people that are important for me, not only because their style, I learn a lot from them, but also because their spirit, because their stubbornness. Because to make films, you have to be very stubborn. You have really to believe that you are going to do it, that you have to fight. And with the years I admire more and more people who become 70 or even older, and they keep making films. I, mean, I think that's great. I think that's wonderful. And my dream is to, to get 70 and 80 and to have a team with people with the same age. You know? uh, I mean, <laughs> I would make a film about this team, you know? <laughs> but uh, it's very difficult. So um, I will watch this. Es totalmente pretencioso. 
claro, eh, los alumnos se quedan un poco a cuadros no sabiendo con qué quedarse. Y es entonces cuando tengo la oportunidad de decirles, precisamente en este pulso entre observación y construcción se asienta el cine que quiere filmar la realidad. La secuencia es de la película Model. Es una secuencia donde se rueda un anuncio de Pantis. Me interesa esta secuencia porque a la vez que durante la película eh, el director nos dice lo absurdo de imponer un modelo estético a la sociedad, creo que en, es, en esta secuencia además está hablando de eh, lo absurdo de imponer un único modelo de cine y que las cosas, igual que hay que mirar hacia otro lado, que las cosas quizás ocurren algo. Él fue nuestro primer profesor de cine y nos enseñó algo fundamental, que son los interrogantes que se hacían en el proceso de trabajo. He elegido una secuencia de, de Welfare donde él le da la, la palabra a un personaje que se acerca allí para buscar ayuda porque tiene que robar y, y entonces no, no le llega la, la ayuda que le dan. Y va no solo a buscar ayuda, sino que lo que quiere buscar son respuestas, algo que tiene que ver con su orgullo, ¿no? con su dignidad. Es decir, ¿por qué se ha roto el contrato social? ¿Por qué él ha cumplido parte del contrato y eso se ha roto? ¿no? Es algo que está muy en boga hoy en día ¿no? y que tiene que ver con toda la gente que la sociedad deja caer por el camino. ¿no? La elección de The Store, una película de 1983 que explica la vida en un centro comercial de Dallas, eh, me vino por la, una escena del principio donde el, el director del centro alecciona a sus trabajadores para que sean unos vendedores despiadados. Me parece una muy buena metáfora de la sociedad norteamericana y del capitalismo. Pero hay algo que me sorprende mucho más de este director, que es su capacidad para filmar a un ladrón o a un policía sin juzgarlos siempre dejando que sean los espectadores los que lo hagamos. Al principio de la película de historia, una secuencia que me agrada mucho, es que hay un grupo de pendientes que, abans de abrir la botiga, se posen a hacer ejercicios de manos para picar bé los piquetes a las cajas registradoras y de sonreírlas. Y hacen ejercicios de cómo han de sonreírlas a la clientela. Entonces, se achecan todas, se posen como en una rollana y en música pueden a ver aquellos ejercicios. Entonces, es un momento que me parece brillante, o sea, un caso surrealista y mucho de humor muy, muy interesante. Y desde que vais a ver esta secuencia, cada vez que vais a, no sé, a un bar o una botiga y entro a una cambrera o algún camatén que no sonríe, que está completamente serios, me em parece una actitud donde es muy real y casi antisistema. Cuando el jefe de la empresa, Neymar Marcus, canta en la fiesta final, de la película de Storm, parece que el capitalismo se encarnara en él y canta. Yes, there were times, I'm sure you knew, when I did all more than I could chew. But through it all, when there was dark, I ended up. And it's been out, I face it all, and I stood tall, and did it my way. son muy interesantes porque realmente puedes ver como a mecenas de prácticamente un mes un solo plan eh, conseguís sintetizar lo que será la esencia del film no? o sea, como aquellos jóvenes reclutas entran dentro del, del edificio de l'espai militar y dejan de ser eh, individuos civiles y pasan a ser militares no? la secuencia con la barbaría no? cuando se rapan al al cabello sería como una mica símbolo ¿no? de la yoga se identifica y cuando al perda no pasan a ser como un, com un nuevo individuo que forma parte de, de una institución que es la jersey 
Bueno, nos ha llamado la atención eh, una secuencia ¿no? de la película de Ley y Orden en la que el jefe de policía de alguna manera invita a los agentes que están en la comisaría a utilizar un lenguaje no racista eh, con, con los ciudadanos, ¿no? con, las, con los detenidos, con las personas que interactúan. Y eso de alguna manera nos hace pensar que quizás es una práctica habitual dentro del cuerpo policial. Una vez más se nos está diciendo con una escena como esta que esto no va tanto de instituciones, sino de las personas que configuran esta institución. Y como personas que son, eh, pues tienen los mismos vicios, tienen las mismas contradicciones y tienen los mismos, los mismos perjuicios que cualquiera en la sociedad. Lo cual nos desmonta el mito de la infalibilidad de una institución tan delicada como es la policía y hace que eh, nos planteemos y que reflexionemos sobre quién vigila a los vigilantes. Está todo muy oscuro, la policía entra, eh, empiezan a mover unos muebles, sacan una mujer debajo de una mesa, una mujer negra que lleva un camisón blanco, la agarran del cuello con el, con el codo así, ¿no? Y de repente durante unos segundos solo se oye eh, a la mujer intentando respirar, ¿no? Eso se alarga un poquito y de repente como que la suelta, se relaja un poco y ella los mira y empieza a preguntar ¿Qué está pasando? ¿Estáis intentando estrangularme? Y otro policía que está al lado le dice, no, no, aquí no está pasando nada, nadie ha visto nada, ¿no? Y, y ella insiste, ¿no? Pero ¿cómo que no? ¿Me estáis estrangulando, no? Y, y el policía dice, no, es tu palabra con, contra la mía, ¿no? Y en ese momento tiene mucha fuerza porque, porque, claro, la cámara está filmando, pero ni siquiera la policía reconoce a, a la cámara como testigo. Una vez un señor de Mali dijo que se montura no había posibilidades de viaje. Por montura referíase a disciplina, a las reglas, a las prácticas, oficio, para poder dominar un lenguaje, para poder dominar. Uh, un oficio para poder trascender. En la DOMS gusta precisamente ver todo eso, ver la relación con mestre, ver la disciplina, o sacrificio, o morrer en vida. Gusta me mucho las reglas, parecen muy importantes. No están muy de moda hoy en día, pero, pero son indispensables para, para esta práctica que o cinema. A Tutico Follies ya me está con que protagoniza Vladimir. Vladimir es un pres que está en un club de mechas que ha determinado su futuro. Y han decidido si Vladimir está curado por marchar o si encara no gusta y se la cara. Vladimir arriba para convencer a que tinta gente que él eh, ha de marchar para que a que centra no es no está ayudando a curarse, sino que está tornando en cara más mala. Um, el discurso de Vladimir es un discurso muy lúcido, pero es también ahora el discurso de un parámetro. Y muy de presa, las partidas son una dona de que Vladimir no marchará de que cada club de metges eh, en troba para nosotros, que por tanto eh, condenará a seguir estando en aquest centro. Eh, yo me identifico muy con Vladimir porque eh, creo que la vida muchas veces está davant de exámenes y tribunales, davant de los cuales estamos en unos de entrada y sobre los que no tenemos cap posibilidad. Muy bien, vale, gracias. Yeah, I, I was thinking uh, while watching this that maybe we, I identify myself with this last sequence, that's why I, I put it, because I feel also like a, either lucid or paranoid, you know, with all our stories and what I was telling you today, so you never know. No? So, uh, you have questions? I can continue, but you tell me, Yus, if we have time, I, will, I can show another uh, four minutes uh, t-shirt, yeah. but I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, you never know because in, in, in the film history, like always, I mean, first it comes the work, it comes the experience, and after you have made some films, you develop a theory, a method. Okay, this is how I make the things, how they should be. But that comes afterwards. You know? At the beginning, you are just trying to do and to do and to do. I think they are very important, something that uh, one filmmaker say, is, they're very important, the rules, the limits. Okay, everything about, it's about the union form and content. Sigaberto was talking about this. 
So we have to impose uh, ourselves some limits. Uh, to frame, it's very important not only what you keep in inside the frame, but more important is what you leave. Uh -huh. And that is, uh, I think, a, a main thing. And uh, in answering to your question, of course, there's a difference between uh, cinema verite and, and direct cinema, uh, which uh, maybe is also not so easy because when I, I read in the newspaper in El Pais, the Spanish newspaper, when Richard Leacock died and also Penny Baker, the uh, director of cinema verite in France and direct cinema in the States, and it's not the same. No? And it's also different to, to uh, separate a direct cinema from observational film making. I don't make direct cinema, I make observational. What is the difference? The difference is that in direct cinema, you respect uh, almost fully the, real, the reality. You respect the, the, the sound, you don't add sounds in post-production, you don't uh, add uh, aesthetical stuff. And, and all the material you have is very rough. Uh -huh. But uh, in, um, you don't put never voiceover. Uh, you should not. But I can put voiceover. I can uh, be a little bit uh, aesthetical and to use uh, traveling. In their cinema, you will never use, you were a purist, an orthodox, you will never use a traveling shot. I, I like very much to add sounds. I like very much the tricks of filmmaking. Okay, they are a temptation, I have to be careful. But I like the tricks. I like to play with sound to make from a, a general shot a close-up and to guide the audience through it. Uh, and you have to hear it in, in, in Black Earth, even though maybe you didn't notice, but it is there, like with the wood and, and so on. No? In, in direct cinema, you will never never do it. Uh, in observational ci cinema, I keep certain distance and I observe. I manipulate, but I don't lie. Mm -hmm. I, I try to make something which combines my vision of life with the reality, what I saw from this moment and from these people. But I am not so interested in life as, as it is, but in life as I see it. So, for me, observational film is more subjective and more uh, personal. No? Even though Frederick Weisman, we were talking after that uh, with him, and he's very conscious that what he's doing is also, I mean, it's cinema. Cinema, cinema is cinema. It's, 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 it's not life. Uh, life is, you cannot, you cannot catch this moment. This moment is gone forever. I mean, we can have uh, this camera. But this is the memory of this moment. We, we will never be like this moment now. So that we cannot catch. Uh, thanks God, huh? we cannot catch it. But, um, but we can catch the process, huh? which is very, very interesting. But this is different. And uh, uh, is, uh, uh, there are real images with real material, but it's different to life. It's art. It's a construction. And Weisman knows that even though he's also orthodox, uh, he makes not an observational cinema, direct cinema, but he's manipulating in a way. But they manipulate more. Maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> would normally do, but not in a way she would normally do it. So um, do you, like, what is, what is that, that then for you, if your characters, like, make up the real situation, and how would you deal with that? Is there, like, maybe, could you tell more about, at least you, you said you don't do interviews, but conversations? It's very difficult, look, okay. uh, the fight between uh, your view and the need to give information, this is the sh Damocles sword of the documentary. Do you understand Damocles sword? This is the danger. 
because I mean uh, this is what uh, relates us to journalism, huh? to give information. We have to give some information to build the argument, but uh, sometimes you have to sacrifice this in benefit of the poetry, of the subjective. Uh, uh, but this is a, a, a continuously uh, tension. Uh? Uh, with the characters, if I don't make interviews, you have a problem. I have a problem. So, so how I am going to transmit the information I should transmit anyhow to keep the story going on. So I try to do it through conversation and I, I try to, mm, to force in one way or another that the conversation will go to certain place. Sometimes I manage, sometimes I do not. So I can calculate four times I do this, one time I, I, can, I can get something good. Huh? But a lot of times I get something which is completely unusual. This is not good. Well, it's not good because the background didn't fit, very important. You put the characters in a place that doesn't fit at all. Uh, because they were not close enough, the two characters, so they didn't trust themselves. So, uh, or because it was my fault. I said something I shouldn't have not. Mm? Uh, if you make interviews, you have to think a lot uh, in which moment are you going to put the question? Because you have sometimes to warm the people, maybe you need half an hour, and then when they relax, you have to attack. Huh? Or maybe it's somebody that you have to attack uh, at the first time. So that you, you need a lot of experience to, to know. Huh? And uh, it's important uh, the level of the camera the distance of the camera and the angle. Wh wh where are they looking to? To the camera, to your eye beside the camera, you are five centimeters, 10, 20, which is a difference, or a meter. So uh, that you have to, to deal with it. If, if the character is playing and he's doing it uh, very well, it's great, of course. Why? Because um, I, I like from fiction that uh, you have the control of everything, that I like it also. Uh -huh. That they are going to do what you want. Uh -huh. That's great in, in fiction. Uh? Okay, I'm going to move the camera here, you're going to look here. That, that's great. In documentary, I try to do this all the time because I want the things in a certain way. You know? Of course, uh, the chance it will appear, but uh, you have to be ready for not. Okay. Because if it's up here, you are ready to catch it. Eh? But you have to prepare all the rest un until this moment. If the character is not acting well, then you have a very big problem because he's going to act. Um, Frances Flaherty, uh, Robert Flaherty's wife, said about Nanook that if during filmmaking, during the watching of film, it appears just for a second uh, the artificiality of the moment that uh, the film will fall down. So, to answer your question, it must not appear just for half a second. Huh? You can do whatever you want, but it doesn't must appear this artificiality, which is our biggest uh, danger. But, for example, Johan van der Koiken, uh, who was a very good filmmaker, and he was manipulating uh, completely, uh, making almost fiction with his character, but you didn't realize it. Mm. So there is not just a method. No? At the end is the result, what is, what counts. No? Mm. No, 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 no. And what is the truth? It's your truth. Huh? Nobody knows uh, any truth in life. You just know your truth, huh? uh, which is enough. Huh? And I think also that films, they might be very s subjective. Huh? What is always very interesting is how we communicate one to the other. Huh? 
So that's why they must have uh, a personality behind. Uh, that is the, the best thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you have just four minutes, because we are uh, late, I can show you a teaser of the film I am trying to make. Eh? Which is just four minutes. It's a film, again, it has to do with water. And it's about uh, breathing, about something which we were doing during thi this uh, one and a half hour all the time. And we are not so conscious. Only when we have problems, we are conscious of how fragile our life is, depending on breath. And I want to make a film about this. But like always, it takes very long to get the money, you know, the, the way. But it's uh, maybe nice to see the, the teaser. Un aplauso para él, venga. 
Senyora Set, senyora Rull, 59, 24, que tenim 24. 24 a 2, 24 a 2. Well, we will see, we will, we will see. Thank you. Well, that's, that's it. <laughs> when we see, we, we make the film. I hope so. So... That's it. We have to, we have to go, no? Yes, well. No, well, I have many th things. Okay. So thank you very much for listening, and I wish you a lot of uh, success. Huh? Thank you. Thank you.